Okay, so people will be joining us now. So we will wait as people join. I can see the number of participants uh, rising. Welcome everybody as you join. Thank you for being with us for this session on the future of work. We'll just wait a moment or two for people to, uh, to log in. How about a joke while we wait, Nick? Yeah, go on then. <laughs> you've probably heard you've probably heard this one, but um, uh, why was the mushroom always invited to parties on the weekend? Tell me, Scott. Because he was a fun guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I see Jason nodding. He's heard that one before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know. That, that was my turn. Over over to Samia now for her joke. <laughs> Okay, no pressure. Okay, we'll get started. We'll get started. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate it's a Saturday morning, or at least it's a Saturday morning in Singapore. Uh, it's a Saturday evening for some people or, or other times. But we're really grateful to uh, people around the world for, for, for tuning in to the UWCSA forum. We're at the start of our second day, and we've had uh, an absolutely extraordinary experience here with, uh, for the first time here in Singapore, really being able to get big crowds together uh, for us. And we've just uh, come out of an inspirational talk by the executive director talking about how we prepare students who are going to um, be making a uh, difference in the world. Yesterday, we heard from Howard Gardner and Andrea Schleicher, um, world renowned educators and, uh, and thinkers around the need to prepare students for, for their future, not our past and so on. And so really, one of the one of the things that's emerging is how we look at our mission in a world of work as well as in a, a, world, a world of activism and of inspiration. So we're really super happy to have parents from four different worlds of work to discuss the connection that they see, or maybe they don't see, between learning uh, as it stands at the moment and the world of work. Um, how do we know that we're developing innovators? How do we honor differences in learning styles uh, and capabilities so that we're allowing all people to join the work face, the workplace, to, to flower, to flourish, to um, bring different perspectives to interactions with others? How do we ensure that students can bring their passion for sustainability uh, and a commitment to equity to the workplace? And so we're gonna be hearing from our, our, our audience, while um, our speakers, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, and then we're gonna be throwing it open to some questions. I'll have some starters, but we'd love to have questions from the audience, which we'll, we'll feed in. And we really wanna have a discussion here um, and keep going a conversation which has started, uh, which will go on many years and decades after today, of course, but where, where we can all deepen our thinking. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Dr. Scott Flower, you want to wave Scott so everyone knows which one who you are, <laughs> is going to be speaking about the need for neurodiverse learners. He's currently with the Financial Services Sharing and Analysis Center, having previously been head of risk and security research at Deutsche Risk. And he'll be drawing on extensive work uh, and experience uh, working even more widely with government, military, corporate, university and NGO sectors over 25 years. Scott's a proud parent of a grade four student. Our second panellist today is Jason Plamenden. Jason joins, do you want to wave Jason? So everyone can see, yeah. Jason joins as a regional sustainability manager from Equinix, a global infrastructure platform provider after holding many roles at Shell. He'll be sharing ideas around how companies can focus on environmental uh, social and governance considerations, which are so paramount in today's, um, today's world, and how we can connect it to the values that matter to students and to the workforce. Jason's parents uh, to Josh and Jake in grades 10 and 11, and husband to Lisa, grade, uh, head of grade two in our primary school. So it's a family affair for, for, for Jason. Um, and our third panelist uh, is Salmia Sanjeev, uh, an alum who's uh, studied here uh, in Singapore from 98 to 99. Welcome back, Salmia. Give us a wave so everyone can see if the screen's full of people at Salmia. Um, Salmia joins us from Capgemini, where she partners with companies to transform and manage their businesses by harnessing the power of technology, having previously spent time with Infosys and McKinsey. She'll be talking about the skills needed in the workplace and the issues of technology, equity, and sustainability. So a warm welcome to you all. Uh, I'd like to start off by inviting uh, Scott to say five minutes around his his uh, his input today, and then I'll pass to the other two, and then we'll get started with some questions. Over to you, Scott. 
Thank you very much, Nick, and uh, pleasure to meet all of you. Many I can't see on the screen, but um, it's, it's great to be invited to be part of a, a really great panel. Um, about, and talking about something that really, I think, uh, is important to all of us, uh, both personally and for our kids, uh, and for the future of many kids around the world, I guess. Um, and um, I'm coming at uh, the future of work from a perspective of someone who's had a very non-linear career path um, and also uh, recently diagnosed only two years ago with adult uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, courtesy of my son's diagnosis. I thought I was just a normal person uh, until two and a half years ago. But um, it was really, uh, it didn't obviously, any a diagnosis doesn't change anything, but I, th I think it certainly provides a point of reflection and um, reflecting on my son first and foremost, and then reflecting on, well, how, how has this uh, condition, this neurodiverse condition impacted on my own uh, development, the way I saw myself and, and the options that I chose as I moved through my career. So, uh, and, and to not over inflate and over hype the benefits of being neurodivergent. And I'll get later on, I guess, into the description of what this is, we're actually talking about later, but um, you know, there's, recent uh, explosion of public discourse around neurodiversity and how it's like a superpower and all of these great things. And that's true, but I think the overselling and overhyping of uh, neurodiversity hides uh, the parts that are really challenging, both for parents of neurodiverse children, and one of you is responsible for the genes in that child, in your child. Uh, so it's probably got a connection to one of you. Uh, so, you know, how parents understand their own children from a neurodiverse perspective, but also how we can help um, children understand themselves and not see themselves as uh, freaks or different or you know um, incapable of functioning. Uh, that's that's really important to me. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you uh, all, hearing questions and and chatting about these sorts of aspects of the future of work. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Samia. Do you want to tell us where your uh, where your perspectives coming from today, and then we'll get started with some questions after Jason. I think uh, from an alum perspective, I just wanted to share my views on you know what are some of the attributes uh, that or qualities that everybody must imbibe and build in order to thrive, you know, in the future. And I would want to reflect some of these qualities, uh, you know, how UWC in particular you know, help define and shape some, shape those. And um, I am a technologist, you know, by profession. I have actually built it. And of course I'm in the industry um, in wearing various hats. So uh, I would also, it, it is a disruption that has impacted us and our next generations. And I would want to probably share my view on, you know, how to brace for the impact. Great. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Nick, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. It's a great event that the UWC is putting on, so thanks, thanks again. For me, I guess my perspective is coming from the work environment being so much different than it was 25 years ago when I first started out in the oil and gas business. Um, there's a huge recognition now that to attract and retain talent, sustainability has to be central to a corporation's strategy. And, and people, you and me and everybody on this call, we're all driven by a purpose, right? We all wanna feel like we're doing good. And we are bombarded every day with opportunities where we can step up and we can contribute. So at the end of the day, organizations, they're just a collection of people like you and me. We're dads, we're moms, we're brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles who, who want to provide for their families, but they also want to make a difference. And organizations who provide that opportunity for people to, to step up and, and make a difference are going to thrive. So that's kind of my perspective coming into this today. Okay, thank you. And that, that's, a great, that's a great sort of reminder there, isn't it? Uh, I think the way you said that about an organization is just people like us brothers, sisters, as you said, because I think sometimes when we talk about the world of work, you know, we may imagine these new tech giants or the old industrial giants or whatever it may be, but it's, it seems how, somehow remote and sort of impersonal. And what you've reminded us there really powerfully, I think, and the other two have alluded to it, is just the centrality of, of human values and of recognizing 
that we're all people. So Absolutely. perhaps that perhaps I can start start with a question there then about, you know, what if we're going to if we're going to be appealing to so many different people around the world in our globalized world, you're really talking about being accessible, equitable, equal, and I think what what you wrote earlier something in our correspondence was about an equality culture. So I'm kind of interested to know what you see corporations doing to help students transition from the world of learning then to a workplace when of course students around the world are so different and the world is changing so rapidly so how, how do we help students with the transition um, as they join the workplace from a world of education yeah great question um and i look forward to hearing some of the other folks on the panel answer that one but i mean at the end of the day you want to acknowledge and respect the differences that people bring to your organization. The transition for students to come into an organization is tremendous. I appreciate that. We all appreciate that. The one thing that I've seen in the organization where I'm at today is a huge support for, you know, enabling people to connect, for enabling people to share their differences, to celebrate their differences and, and a huge amount of compassion around people who are, might be struggling um, and support for those people. You know, back when I first started, you just did your work. Nobody really knew what was going on in behind the scenes. You were a guy with a certain kind of personality at work and then you were a different guy at home. Today, it seems like there's a lot more acceptance for those people and who they are at home to be in the workforce. You know, I have an example uh, that I'd like to share. Just recently, a, a colleague of mine, she was struggling at home and at work. And she just put out a message on an employee forum, you know, hey, things are tough, lots going on at work, lots going on at home. And it was amazing the amount of support that she received from all of those people within that forum. And I thought to myself, it's excellent that today we have the systems in place, not only to share those struggles, but we have a culture that kind of values that vulnerability. You know, the stigma is gone. It's lessening, it's not gone. And there was so much caring and support in the, in the forum. And, and lastly, we have programs in place to help those people. So sometimes you just want to be heard and have a little bit of a, a chat. But we also have the employee assistance programs that are there to support folks like that. So um, the transition is obviously a big one, but organizations are recognizing it and doing a lot to help. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I don't know, Samia, from your perspective, um, what what that means for you in terms of, you know, your experience as, as a student at school and, and your transition. How does that resonate with you um, hearing, you know, what, what Jason's described is quite a, I mean, actually, actually quite a moving case, actually. Someone just put out there their vulnerability and they were supported. How, how do you see that as, a, as something that schools can encourage and, and build in so it feeds into that culture and grows it? Actually speaking, um, you know, Jason's spot on, right? Um, however, in terms of, you know, uh, I can tell you my transition, I, I came in uh, to UWC from a slightly conservative culture, yeah, and um, essentially those couple of months while, we, while at UWC with the diversity at scale, as I call it, in that one little ecosystem in terms of nationalities, in terms of, you know, different kinds of people and experiences, it kind of transforms you, it just broadens your mind, right? So the transition actually into the workforce in terms of, you know, it wasn't as disruptive as it could have been had I not gone through, you know, that couple of months. And for me, I think that is important. I think uh, the only thing is we just need to keep making sure we are moving with the times and making sure we have, you know, that diversity that's contributing to this natural, you know, balance that's getting created uh, to go away. That's about it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. S Scott, I'm thinking this ties quite closely with what we were speaking about just before we went live around. Yeah, uh, it does. And I like, I like Jason's example as well, because it talked about the individual and then took us to the social. And I think 
for, for neurodivergent or neurodiverse people, I think there's a risk for us as educators, but also within the broader economy that we focus on these neurodiverse people and we forget that they're part of society. And what we need to do, it's a, it's a two-way communication between linear thinking people and non-linear thinking people, uh, you know, neurodiverse and neuronormal people. And, and it's not just about providing support and education for the people who are neurodiverse, but allowing others to in interact with them and understand those people better by educating them as well, right? So it, I really like that uh, start point that Jason put us on. But speaking to directly to transitions, the concept of moving from one place to another, from high school to university or to workforce, I think for neurodiverse individuals, uh, this is a really big challenge because whether you have ADHD or um, autism spectrum disorder on it on a huge continuum, it's very diverse, but uh, what often these people struggle with and, and, and I struggle with personally day to day is uh, executive functioning and working memory. Now, um, so when you talk to me about transition, I have trouble moving from one thing to another thing and my son does too. So when he's reading a book, he's hyper-focused because that's a, another angle of uh, ADHD is hyper-focused or distracted. It's a binary kind of thing. Um, so this concept of transitioning at a macro scale from I've had a routine where I go to school, my classes are clear every day, I know what I'm doing every day, this period, this period, lunch is at this time, moving into the workforce or university where it's completely unstructured, that is really, really hard, right? So I think in terms of what are the skill, the broader skill sets behind the scenes we need to look at, it's really about, well, how do we, for all of our students, not just uh, neurodiverse students, but teaching them that you've been in this world for 12 years, learning, being educated from the top down kind of thing. And uh, that's not going to be there when you leave here at the end of your, you know, GCSEs or, you know, IBs or whatever it is. It's different. And we need to prepare them for that transition in a very big conceptual way and a very operational way. So I think, you know, it's not just um, neurodivergent people who have struggled with uh, executive function and planning and everyone does when they leave high school, right? And I think there's having some curriculum element around that transition, I think would be very valuable for all students, not just neurodiverse students. So I think, yeah, that's what I'd like to say there about transition at least. Yeah, and I think, you know, framing, framing it that way is something that as educators, we, we often think, which is if you cater for vulnerable parts of the population, such as let's say a neurodiverse uh, group, actually the best way to cater them is often just to do everything better. It's not actually to single them out as different. Quite often, good practices are good practices, and they will benefit the most vulnerable more, perhaps, than some other communities. But actually, some of it's just good practice. So, so let me, but let's follow that up for a minute with, with, with neurodiversity, because you've mentioned two populations there, maybe autistic spectrum and maybe um, ADHD, which are both broad, broad categories, of course. But do you want to say a bit more about neurodiversity as an idea and how and why it might be relevant to the future of work? And then let's hear, hear Jason and Salmi sort of respond in, in their context around what neurodiversity might bring um, if we perhaps embraced it more than we do currently. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of my anecdotes or whatever I talk about today is very much about ADHD because I, I live with it and my son has it. And, and uh, But there are many different um, aspects of neurodiversity. So uh, ADHD and uh, autism spectrum disorder is just two of those. We also have Tourette's. Uh, syndrome, it's only about 1% of the uh, neurodiverse population have Tourette, so it's a, a small thing, but still very important to mention. Um, but really, dyscalculia is one of the, the other ones, dysgraphia um, and uh, dyslexia. Uh, they're, they're very significant in terms of neurodiverse people. Um, and so they're the, the, the labels, if you want to call, say there's labels of different conditions for neurodiversity, that's, that's the labels or the label set. Um, or dyspraxia as well, they've renamed it. Uh, it's uh, developmental coordination disorder. It's no longer dyspraxia. So but it, that covers all of the different labels. Um, but I guess, you know, what does it mean? Um, they're a community of people. Uh, often there's a very high incidence of comorbidity. So for example, uh, kids and adults who have ADHD, about just, just over 50% of those people who are diagnosed with ADHD, have at least one other comorbid condition. So they might have dyslexia and ADHD. 
they may have Tourette's ADHD, ASD, ADHD. So, I mean, these are these are quite complex. Um, I don't even like to word, use the word disorder um, because I don't feel I'm a disordered person, uh, you know, having had much joy and success in life, but it, it is a condition. Um, but I think, yeah, so they're, they're very distinct that you can say, well, this group or cohort of people in society have very unique conditions. And it's not just about the way they think creatively, which is relevant for the future of work, but it also brings in uh, very interesting aspects of the sociality. How do they interact with other human beings? Uh, so their disorders or their conditions mean they interact very differently. They communicate quite differently because they conceptualize things differently, right? And language is just a form of structure. It's just a form of syntax of, you know, sets of grammars that, so the way they think obviously has an impact on communication as well. So that's what unifies this neurodiverse community, regardless of their disorder or challenge. Um, now, um, just to put some numbers around it, how, how, why are we, why am I even passionate about it? It's not a small fringe issue, okay? Just over 7% of the world's population has some form of neurodiverse condition. And that's based on the largest ever meta-analysis of over 170 studies uh, done. That study was in 2015, the most recent. But I mean, this is a very significant issue because regardless of uh, what race you are, what religion you are, this is uh, distributed statistically evenly and equally to Jason's point about equality and stuff and equity. This, this set of disorders doesn't discriminate it hits everyone, regardless of colour, creed, belief. And I think that's why this is important um, as a topic. And for the future of work, we now live uh, in a post-industrial age where innovation and disruption uh, is key, right? That's where the whole, the whole uh, digital economy, that's it, all built on this disruption and this innovation and transformation. Now, it's actually non-linear thinkers, neurodivergent thinkers, when you do some rough numbers, and I have people like Albert Einstein, Bill Gates, and, and they are, yeah, names we're familiar with, but these are people with ADHD or dyslexia, uh, you know, uh, and they struggle in lots of parts of their lives. Yes, they may have become famous for whatever their field was, but in their own personal life and looking at the whole human, that's an important issue there, I think. So understanding these, um, you know, to go to Jason's point in his example, this person who no longer needs to hide their personal self in the workplace, they can feel comfortable being themselves in their work environment, that is different. And so therefore we need to uh, calculate for and account for this diversity in the personal life, which brings fruits into the employment place into their job to be disruptive, to think creatively, differently, and then businesses benefit from that. Um, but that's to over romanticize because they struggle as well. But it's really a win-win here, isn't it? Because these people will feel then validated and perhaps if previously excluded, it's good for them, obviously, and there's a social moral piece there, but it's also good for everyone because people, it will benefit businesses too. So, I mean, it's a win-win overall. So I'm what's, your, what's your experience then? And what's your sort of thoughts on the future of, of work as it, as as you know, as Scott said, in terms of embracing and seeing the benefits for individuals and society and business overall, if we can embrace the neurodiverse populations. Sorry, yeah, actually, who was that addressed to? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Jason, go ahead. Sorry, first, go on. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, thanks. So, I mean, kind of stepping back a second and thinking about how our organization thinks about sustainability, because that's what we're talking about on the social side. I mean, so, social sustainability is really about promoting well-being, right, for people at work and at home. Um, it includes their quality of life. It includes equality, equity, social cohesion, and diversity. And diversity, when it comes to neurodiverse folks, Funny story. I mean, I didn't even know what neurodiverse meant as a concept. I heard about it a few weeks ago when I first met Scott uh, in our preparation for this panel session. Um, and then that week at work on the employee network forum, someone was sharing some of their struggles as a neurodiverse person. And I just thought it was interesting that I, at 40, almost 48 years old, I had never heard of the concept of neurodiverse. I learned about it. And then that that very week, someone shared a story about their struggles about being in an organization 
and 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 being ADHD as well. So I thought that was cool. But at the end of the day, in our corporation, as an example, there's an employee network. There's nine actually employee networks, and they promote developing these networks. There's the Faith Connect. There's Black Connect. There's Indigenous Connect. There's a lot of them. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a neurodiverse connect, there might be. But the point is that there are networks of people with similar um, struggles, similar per backgrounds, cultures, and they can share. And just having these networks available helps people feel like, you know, th they're safe, they're included, they belong. Um, yeah, so I mean, maybe I'm kind of mumbling on a bit, but the point being organizations are recognizing the importance and, and of diversity, how important it is to their organization. And they're embracing that and, and trying to find ways to, to, to bring it, you know, yeah. bring the advantages of having those diverse uh, employees. Yeah, thank you. No, you're not mumbling at all. And it's wonderful that organizations are doing this. They're being the change that we need to see. Samia, what's your, what's your experience of this and, uh, and your thoughts on it for the future of work? In terms of what I see in particular, uh, you know, there are various facets and various ways to look at it. Uh, diversity, you know, fuels innovation, as my co-panelists suggested. And actually speaking in our industry, um, innovation is an asset, you know, and we also sell it as a concept, right? It's a business as well. So when we actually, uh, you know, package this and essentially run some of our innovation ideation sessions, we have various facets of people behind the scenes. Of course, we we actually make sure that we don't, you know, kind of call it out or create groups so that you know people are not self-conscious in some sense. But we try and play on everybody's strengths to actually bring something that that would wow us and of course, you know, society and customers at large. But uh, and there are conditions that we know of you know, when put sensibly in the workflows can actually bring out different attributes. So we know, I mean, without giving too much detail, but, you know, we know that there is this person who is, uh, who is not able to function in a particular way, but is very creative. So, you know, in a conference setting, um, you know, rather than being just a transcriptor, he actually scribes and he draws out, you know, the conversations at large. And that's a very good tool for synthesis, you know, for example, of ideas. So that's how, that's one of the ways that we channel and kind of, you know, uh, bring it along. So, I mean, the, so the theme there, isn't it, is, is, is adapting the organizations to the individual rather than always assuming the individual has to adapt to the organization. Which is, exactly. That's a, that's a person-centered organization, isn't it? Absolutely. So that, uh, we've got an interesting question here on the chat. Um, uh, one of our colleagues actually here, here at, at DWC has said, as a uni university advisor, I work with students each year who see their educational path and career path as a straight line with limited obstacles. So I guess a linear sort of approach. When I try to talk about the fact their life will zig and zag and that they should be prepared for change and transitions, I get the sense they don't believe that this can happen to them. And uh, how, how can we present the information? How, and he's asking, how can we be convincing and help students really embrace that thing and not necessarily think, right, maybe, and I, I can think of an example myself there. You know, the student who says, my parents were doctors. I know I'll need to be a doctor. I need to study chemistry or uh, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, and that frame of mind, which is very much perhaps history now, or certainly becoming less common, we do sometimes see it at school. And, and I think he's, he's talking about the psychology of convincing people that it's a bit different. Do you have any thoughts or advice on that from your experiences? Dissonance is not a problem of youth. Dissonance is a problem of humanity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think really, how can you relate to something if you haven't experienced it? So I think that the challenge as an educator or a mentor for, for younger people is we need to take them there, whether that be through simulation, um, a really cool tech platform that Salmi has developed, you know, that takes them on a life journey or whatever, and they choose your own adventure. I used to use the choose your own adventure books, right? They were cool. You, you could go to page 51 or 72 or 85 and 
oh, I don't like the end of that story. I'll go back. Um, but I think there's, that we have to bridge the dissonance because when you're young, you're indestructible. You think you know everything. You're never going to get old. And uh, we don't want them to age. We don't want them to think that, you know, they've got to become adults because you should enjoy your youth. I'm, I still am. I haven't grown up yet. Um, you know what I mean? So, but I think we ha- that's the key to this is if we want to explain to them, we have to really kind of get them really take them there in a way, psychologically immerse them in, well, this is what really is going to, life is going to be like. And most of it's mundane and boring, but there'll be choices and, and you can take a nonlinear path if you follow what your passion is, for example, you will be good at it. Now, schools have a problem in that you've got to make these building blocks. You've got to do this course to go to that course. And and that can be uh, problematic, especially for neurodiverse people, because they're already there potentially and then they're bored and then they be disruptive. So, But I think for the general population, the total population, we need to remove this dissonance through new technology, through, you know, relationships with people who have been there, who have had a non-linear life or, or you know and also final point focus on their skills and their character so what are their core personal skills or you know if they're if they're um you know caring for others well okay what industries are you know you are you rewarded greatest for being caring and thoughtful of others for the person who's just interested in doing the maths and cutting a quick trade okay jp morgan's for you kind of thing do the quant thing, fine. You don't need to be good with people, do you? So focus on that. That's your passion. But help them understand the relationship between so um, themselves, their qualities, not just what A or B or C they got in whatever subject, the bigger picture, them as individuals, their strengths from a personal qualities as well as their intellect. And then they can take that zigzag path, I think. So that's, that's all I could really add there. Thank you. Samia, so is a tech platform the solution? <laughs> me just me you never know <laughs> um maybe i'll just chip in if i could nick yeah so i mean building on what uh, scott was saying i think if i if i think of the lifelong learning journey that we're on right so an industry we continue to learn we're taking courses all the time And a key kind of enabler of that learning is centered around case studies, right? So we do lots of case studies, learning from people who have gone through experiences, uh, having speakers come in, share a life experience, whatever. So, I mean, as as an educational institution, I guess case studies are are a good example of how you can share um, that kind of learning with your students. It's not so technical, but I'm kind of traditional kind of guy. And... And as an example, I mean, as an individual myself who came from a really small town in northern Alberta, Canada, and I'm sitting in Singapore on a panel with these awesome folks talking about neurodiversity and sustainability. I mean, that is definitely not a straight career path. And, you know, having people like uh, the folks on this panel come into the school as kind of an organized session for the students to hear from uh experienced individuals who've had those non-linear career paths that might be a cool uh cool opportunity yeah so it's re- really modeling it and, and letting people see that that's what's happening already uh, and undercutting perhaps some of the assumptions there okay thank you i'm going to go on to another question here from uh Oyegoga, uh which is about well-being in in the workplace um and indeed in schools uh, and the question is in order to enhance the socio-emotional well-being of people Shouldn't we be rethinking the extent to which schools and workplaces set high expectations for students and workers in terms of performance? So a challenging question there, really cutting to the heart of high performance organizations, which is almost a sort of an assumption perhaps that we often have, let's try and do things really well. It's a really fundamental question about what we're trying to achieve in our organization. So a really high level future of work question. Who should we start with, Salmia? What are your thoughts on that? That's a very challenging question. It is indeed, um, actually. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, can I go next, if you don't mind? Oh, it's, it's, it needs a bit of thought, doesn't it? Because it's such a, it's such a, wow, what, what, how, what to make of it? So sorry to spring it on you, but there it is. Go on. Uh, Scott uh, or, or Jason, chip in. Well, let, let, I, I think uh, Salmi was already under pressure when I asked her to do a joke before we went live, Nick. You're doing it to her twice in one call is not really good. Uh, <laughs> 
But I mean, I think it's a brilliant question and it is a really deep one. And with that deep question in my mind, I'm thinking there's a simple answer. Actually, it's about alignment. And it's about whoever you are, you will know if you can step back from yourself. Uh, and that's a, a process to learn. But think about what you really love. An organization shouldn't have to whip you and drive you and KPI you into the ground to get the best out of you and for you to feel like you're doing your best. And, um, you know, I think if, if people, the organizations can make sure they align people, their core interests, what they love to do, and they, they don't feel like it's work anymore, it's just what their passion is, then it's much, much easier to be happy and successful in the workplace. So, and we all have to do jobs that we hate at some point. We all have to, and that's part of also learning uh, and finding and calibrating your way through it. But I think um, that is a really important message we need to make clear to students, but also to adults in, in the workforce is, if you're not happy in work and you're struggling to perform, you may want to reconsider what you're actually doing. And that may be taking that zigzag, taking a risk and going, actually, I always wanted to be a dancer and a dance instructor. Okay, if that is what's going to make you happy and perform at your best, then that's what you kind of probably need to do. If you can do that in a small way, because you can't, you have to transition, right? You can't just go from being that quant at JP Morgan and then, you know, you're teaching uh, ballet. You can't do that because you need to have an income to survive, but there will be a way to build your path to what you want to do and be happy doing it. And I think that alignment is key. It's a nice, simple concept to take away when we're looking at the socio and uh, welfare aspect of this, because that's very individual, it's very subjective, but as long as the person for themselves asking that question in themselves, we'll get there. You know what I mean? We don't have to do the organizational heavy anymore. Yeah. So there's enough yeah. variety, there's enough diversity in the workplace that it's just finding the right fit, really. Okay. okay. Absolutely. And Nick, if I could add on to that, a lot of the work that I've done in my career has been around risk, right? And mental well-being is a, is, can be treated a bit like risk, right? The risk of someone being unwell. And so there are preventative measures and there are recovery measures. And when you think about the preventative measures, Scott's absolutely right when you think about alignment, right? And, and organizations are getting a lot better at getting that alignment, much like your teachers, right? We also have goals and performance assessments at a, on a quarterly basis, which basically say, Here's the goals and performance expectations that we agree on, and we'll check in every quarter on how you're doing. So that alignment is a preventative measure to impacts to your mental health. And then on the recovery side, organizations have also gotten a lot better at providing things like employee assistance programs, or we have a, a fund actually that our employees can contribute to that actually goes towards donations to employees who are having hardships. Right. So someone who's going through a tough time can apply for that fund, which is fully funded by the employees and matched dollar for dollar by the corporation. So there's preventative and recovery. And another thing that just comes to mind is when I was with Shell, um, I was a trained mental health first responder and there were several of them throughout the organization. I mean, who would have heard of that sort of thing 20 years ago? So those types of recovery measures are examples of how you can deal with the, the well-being issue. Yeah, and as you say, such a transformation in, in the workplace from, from 20 years ago. That, as you say, these, these acronyms, EAPs, uh, wouldn't have been just around at all. The, the, the thinking behind them, but now they're commonplace. So very, very positive there. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we've gone from the quite specific, if you like, around, around things. And I wonder if we might, might sort of broaden it out a little bit to... Uh, ask just a very general question, which I, we can approach in so many ways, because, you know, the, the title of this, this session is the future of work. So one of the questions that's there in our prep as we thought about this was, what is the future of work? I and mean, that's such a big question. Howard Gardner raised it, you know, Andrew Schleicher rather raised it yesterday and said, maybe the future is actually more a future of leisure. And we should be talking about the future of lives, not the future of work or the future of leisure, but the future of lives. Well, what's your thought around that? Because I think it ties into what you, we're all saying here around around organizations fitting humans, around looking at employee needs, about the corporations using KPIs to fit people rather than force them. So what's your thought around the big, big trajectory that you're seeing in workplaces over your, over your times in the workplace? 
let's just open it and give everyone a minute to speak when they're ready on that one. It's a big question. Uh, you know, Nick, um, I think it's a hugely deep and problematic question because what we have is a legacy economic structure globally. Uh, and until we reconceptualize how humans generate and store and exchange the value they produce, then we're not going to be able to transition much from what we currently have because uh, there's a uh, you know significant and growing inequality of wealth in this world, and that concentration is affecting the ability for billions to have the potential to realise what their their you know their individual uh, you know skills qualities actually are. So without the economic structure, and this sounds like I'm a revolutionary, right? I'm not. I'm very much you know I've got a PhD from the School of Economics and Government in Australia. Like I'm a very straight laced guy, but when you really dive into the numbers, we have a problem here, a very deep structural economic problem. And, you know, you say, well, where's the future of life? Well, if you can't generate income to buy food or pay rent or, well, guess what? All of those robots that steal jobs or, yeah, there's going to be a few technicians to fix the robots and there's going to be a few coding types who want to reprogram the, the, the robots, et cetera, who are taking many of the jobs. But I think really long term, we are going to have to solve this problem of how do we as humanity develop a structure that accounts for the creation of value, the exchange of value and the storage of value in a way that's equitable and allows us to have these lives without work, because that is actually where we're going at some point. Uh, and that is some sort of utopia, hopefully not dystopia, uh, with Big Brother and the way the convergence of technologies or the bifurcation of the internet, all these big, big problems, right? But I think that's the heart of it. And from there, once we figure that out, we can have an amazing future potentially. Uh, but, you know, there are worrying signs about where it can go to dystopia as well. And the short, yep. the short sort of 10 year span is there's going to be, yeah, revolution of work. We don't know where it's going, but I can tell you, we're probably going to, there will be less jobs relative to population. Yeah. And I mean, so what we do, you know. I mean, Jason's referred to all the sort of transformation he's seen in, uh, in his time. And Sammy, your, your, your work is, is around transformation. That, that, that's kind of, you know, how you're helping companies to transform, obviously, digitally as a focus and so on. But I mean, maybe, maybe that question around the future of work for you, we could couch it very specifically around what are you helping people transform from and what are you helping them transform towards? Because it's, it's your daily bread and butter, isn't it? So tell us a bit about what you're doing there. So... So in terms of, you know, we obviously look at from a business perspective, we are obviously, you know, looking at transforming companies which are in different trajectories and different, uh, you know, facets and phases, stages. Um, however, uh, however, uh, you know, the transformation. Um, the, sorry, let me just. That's all right. Uh, it's a with you, isn't it? It's a, <laughs> we're all here in the morning. Let me, let, me, let me ask it more specifically, perhaps, because because it's such a broad question, isn't it? That it's very hard to it's very hard to, to to sort of address it at the highest level. What what what's hard for companies in their transformations? What what are you seeing that? Why are they coming to you? What is it that they're trying to do that they need help with that's not happening naturally? Yeah, so um, I mean the complexity and the you know the problems that we solve for our companies, of course, are very different, and. Actually, it's it's um, symbiotic with phases of life, and if I may, you know. So uh, one of the uh, the sectors that I'm focused on, for example, and we're trying to help them embrace from an innovation perspective, is is tackling two very very causes that are topical to our lives: the deaths and the impact of the COVID uh, of the pandemic, and second, you know, the aging population, essentially. Because of these two issues, you know, this particular business is not able to sustain, you know, and protect, right? So essentially, how do you brace for, this is a natural transition of life, you know, we believe uh, life is all, life is balance and nature, right, essentially, and that is pr practically the future. I see a, con a, conver a conversions when it comes to, you know, the work and the boundaries between life and work are blurred, essentially. 
Yeah. And I, I mean, what you said there are two, you know, we've been talking about change, but you just mentioned two things there which are going to impact everything we do, obviously the pandemic, but demographics, the demographic changes in many countries toward an aging population, for example, will just be so hugely impactful that, that the change is inevitable. So, you know, I think what you've reminded us there is just the complexity and interconnected nature of things. I wonder, Jason, you know, if, if I could follow up with you there, because I'm interested that, you know, you have had work with one of the big global biggest companies in the world with Shell, and you said how much it's transformed. I wonder if in terms of transformation, you could tell us because for some of us or me, perhaps, and perhaps I've just got this wrong, but I kind of in my mind, I realized I saw Shell as kind of if you like, part of the old world, if you like, and you know, Apple, Google, tech as part of the new. And I think that's probably a mistake on my part. So what have you seen in terms of the giants transforming, uh, you know, from from what was an industrial model to, to looking to, to much a much greener, more sustainable future and more perhaps we can get into the topic of sustainability, uh, which I know is close to all of our hearts, too. So what's your thoughts on that? I mean, huge amount of change in Shell over the 23 years that I worked there, right? Um, indeed, they were a very traditional kind of dinosaur company, or that's how people view them even today. But I've seen tremendous amounts of change in all of the things that I've been discussing today. The things that I've been discussing today are not uh, only things that are in the company that I work for today, which is a digital infrastructure company, but there are things that Shell is also doing before I left and have been doing for some time. Going back to the, the kind of what work is in the future, I think it's purpose-centered work. And the, the whole pandemic, which Samia uh, alluded to, kind of allowed people to refocus themselves, take a step back. They got a bit of a breather. They're at home with their families. They recognized, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be, you know, work to live. Maybe it is more about live to work. And so for me, my personal belief is the future of work is purpose-centered work. And if I think about my career, I took a marketing degree, right? I thought I was going to be an advertiser. I was going to walk into boardrooms and sell them commercials and just like in the movies, right? That was my big plan. And I did that for a couple of years with Shell on the marketing side of our downstream business. But it was a very short time, five years it took for me to realize that this was not a lot of purpose. I mean, selling fuels and lubricants to industrial customers, not a lot of purpose there. So I actually made the jump to our upstream business and became the liaison between our communities that we were impacting with our activities and the people in the boardroom who were coming up with all the plans to drill wells, to put in pipelines. And that for me gave me a lot of purpose. It was like, okay, now I can, I can communicate what's going on in the community, how they're impacted into our boardroom so they understand so that they can put in place mitigations, avoidance, um, to, to, to deal with those issues. And so that for me, purpose-centered work is the future of, of work for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, powerful. Have a mission. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Samia, Scott, would you like to, either of you like to comment on that one? What do you think? Having a mission. I, I, I think, uh... I'm wondering how Jason spied on me and, and figured out my background in life like that. Um, it, yeah, <laughs> when I look back, regardless of, and I've had very diverse jobs. So when I didn't go so well in high school and, and really didn't get into university, went into the military for four years, and that was a very distinct kind of job, right? Uh, bombing stuff with artillery is not very useful in civilian life. But um, all the skills I you know, learned there allowed me to transition into a different career, which was mountain guiding in New Zealand for 10 years and, and working on the rescue team, completely different skill set. And then, and then I spent, uh, after doing some study as a mature age uh, student, I uh, worked as a spy in the Australian government for three years, uh, before then going on to do a PhD, um, becoming an academic. And now I've reskilled again and now I'm in cybersecurity. What the common thread is across the 30 years since I left high school is the mission. I've always had a mission. You know, whether it was in the military with a small team of people with a very clear task or whether it was guiding with one to one with a client, you know, or on the rescue team or whether it was working as, a, as an intelligence uh, analyst and officer, whatever it was, there was a very clear mission that I had and that drove me and it didn't feel like work because I was just doing what I loved to do and I knew I had an impact because I had a purpose and I was 
mission, right? I was built for that purpose because I self-selected. I had a bias, you know, and again, looking back, my ADHD helped me do that. As the psychiatrist said to me when he diagnosed me, he said, my goodness, you're just all over the place. Uh, how do you do that? And I said, well, I just went with what I wanted to do. I followed where my purpose was and I just knew I needed to do that. So I reskilled, I retrained and then I did it and I did it and I loved it and it didn't feel like work anymore. And then when I got bored of it, probably because of my ADHD again, at some point you get bored, then I went, no, I actually want to do something completely different. Um, and for the parents out there, because I've got my parents sitting over here listening to me today, uh, they're going home to, back to Australia tonight. But as parents, you have such a, an important role to play um, because for children to take risks and uh, take the nonlinear path, they need to feel secure. They need to feel attached. They need to feel loved regardless of the outcome. And they need to feel that, yeah, you're not being a lawyer like I am or you know, whatever I was, but I don't really care what you want to do, lovely daughter or son. Just do what you want. Be happy and you will excel. And that, that's a double-edged thing for parents because we know, and I'm looking at the questions in the column here, you know, how do we prepare students going into dead-end careers, dead-end jobs? Well, don't worry about that so much just yet. Get them to, they will figure that out. But we have to make them feel supported and loved regardless of their choice. If they're good at it, then let them go to that because they have found their mission. They've found their purpose and just enable them and support them and make them aware of the downsides of taking the risk because there are downsides. Don't overplay all this beautiful utopia, but say, yeah, you know, if this doesn't go right, there's a cost to that. There's an extra year of study to recalculate or calibrate or whatever. So, yeah, I think that's a big part of this is children, yeah, they're being educated to work, but again, that they're, they're human beings, they're whole complete units and parents have a massive role to play in supporting the children from an emotional well-being perspective to then take the risk, you know, to grow, to not be wrong. And I'm a fan of Ken Robinson, as I'm sure all the educators here are, um, you know, we need to um, stop saying, no, you can't be a dancer, that won't pay. No, you can't be an artist, even though you may be the next Da Vinci, doesn't matter, it won't give you the job that you need. We re that's the next transition for parents, not just the education system. Uh, we can't lump it all onto you guys, Nick. We have some responsibility here. We are accountable here. We can't say, oh, they did, should be teaching that in the class. Uh, no. Um, and I'm grateful for my parents that regardless of whatever happened in, I, you know, underperformed in high school, shocked the pants off them when I went to university 13 years later, right? But they, they actually gave me the confidence, right? I knew if it went bad, I could just go home. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And that safety and security is something that you can't uh, pay school fees for. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that, I think that's the, the bit that I would say. Yeah, we're circling back there, aren't we, to, 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 to the fundamental humanistic thing, the fundamental thing that people have to come first and connection and, 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 and love from our families and, and connection with our people is, is at the root of it all. So, so Sammy, what's your thought around that, around mission and, and around... Um, finding your your role in the world what are you seeing in the workplace and, and in your own life with regard to to that piece around the purpose and the the, the driven sort of uh, intention or to, to, to make a difference to, to whatever it is so i think uh, just to build on uh, jason's point about purpose and mission i think you know that of course that that is a you know that should be a given but unfortunately for some it isn't but if the mission and the purpose gives you a little bit of roots, if I may, you know, it kind of keep, keeps you to the ground and humble, but it has to be complemented with resilience and grit, because in order to survive and thrive, you need that, right? And of course, you need to keep your feet on the ground, and that's where the purpose and the mission gives you that anchor, if I may. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That, so you're really talking about the skills and the qualities, which is, uh, which I'm, I, was, I was thinking around that it's very much linked to the other points around all the things that we do that are different. They'll, they'll, re, they'll rely on a, a foundation, a bedrock, uh, or, or, which will be transferable to, to others. Yeah, thank you. Let, let me, no, Noah's put a question in the chat there that I think everyone can see, and you've addressed a little bit partly there, uh, uh, Scott, in what you said. Um, one of the things that this is the world of work we'll talk to now, 
It's around how do we prepare and support students in fields which may be a dead end or so on or replaced. Andrea Schleicher talked about this yesterday. What are we doing? How are we getting the truck drivers, which is a massive industry, ready for the automation of uh, trucks if that happens in a decade or so, as he said. And for a minute, I want to sort of, if you want, not talk about schools. We talked about those a lot. I'm more thinking about structural things in the world of work because this is this is the future of work. It's allowing people to do what we've just said to drop to, to go between one and the other profession or, or, or work over their lives. And I don't think that we should underestimate what you've just said there, Scott, around the security and the connection. But at the same time, it's not just that. There have to be structural things in place. So as employers yourselves or working in organizations, how do you think about ensuring that you or your colleagues or whoever it may be can make the changes? How do organizations take responsibility for preparing workers to slip to, to swap fields? Because it's almost self-defeating. You're almost preparing people to leave you. But at the same time, you know you want to accept people from other professions. So you almost have a duty to prepare people to go into those professions. And you know, that's a systemic thing that maybe it's a legacy thing, as you mentioned, Scott, that we have a system that's not designed for that. But how are you seeing that? And what are your thoughts on? on how we can do that structurally as organizations to prepare people for the mobile future, which we think is ahead of them. Jason, what, what, start us off, what do you think? Yeah, really interesting question, Nick. And you know, if I go back to what we've got in place in the company I'm at now, but also at Shell previously, you know, it's called an individual development plan. So apart from your goals and performance assessment that you know, talks about alignment on what you're going to achieve in the year and how you're going to get there and the KPIs and all of that. We have these individual development plans that aren't specific to what you're doing, the work you're doing, but it's more around your interests. What, what do you want to achieve? What are you interested in? And these individual development plans are updated on a biannual basis and talked about with your manager. It basically says, look, I'm here in the organization, but I'd like to be over there. And there's a lot of support for that. And it, you know, I, I don't want to sound kind of like I'm tooting your horn at UWC, but this whole idea that you guys have of lifelong learning, it's absolutely fact, right? And organizations who embrace that and support their employees to do that lifelong learning and continue to pursue, you know, advancement or doing things that they're interested in, those organizations will thrive. Those are the organizations where the best employees will come to and they'll want to stay. Yeah, it's taking the big picture, eh? Taking the big picture. Yeah, that's yeah absolutely. Thank you. Samia, what, 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 what are your organization doing for this? And I know we've got a couple of minutes left, so we'll, we'll wrap this up in a minute, but just really interested to hear your thoughts on, on that bigger piece there. I think um, building on what Jason started, you know, of course, we, we, we also offer career paths, which is based on your uh, pace as well as priority, you know, in life. And you know we complement that with a structured mentoring program. Okay. So you know even though even though people may be in different facets of life, you know, and have different preferences, but sometimes they get limited, you know, very soon. So at that point in time, you know, there are mentorship programs that actually take you know walk you walk you through all the options and permutations and combinations in terms of the future that you can have, you know, potentially with the company or they actually make you also go through some meditative techniques to understand where you would want to be, right? And if there's a convergence. So there's a very holistic way to kind of guide and bring it all together. And I think that is uh, that is working out quite well, actually. It's, it's giving you so it sounds like you two are in companies that really take a, a really personal, not organizational view, a really, really tailored yes. to, to, to your individual sort of aspirations. To okay. get the best out of you. Yeah, Scott, I'll ask you to to, to give us a, a final word on this, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. What, what's your well, thought? You said you could. You said we could toot the horn here, um, so I'm going to do that. So, and I do it, I guess, with a bit of a personal interest and bias. Um, you're right, uh, Jason and Salmia talk about the met, like you mentioned, the mentor program, but that requires investment, right? Investment. It's not just talking, but it needs money because to set. If they're not uh, working, then they're mentoring, which means there's a gap of work being done, right? So you, you need investment in these capabilities. You've got to spend money to get the value. You don't just get it for nothing or loading more on top of someone. 
And I know uh, my son used to go to this amazing uh, after school enrichment you know, class. And it was, uh, I forget the name, it was uh, called Critical Mass Investigations. This guy, he's, I don't know if he's still at the school, but it was uh, run in the top of the building at Dover. And he would bring in children who had, you know, neurodiverse issues, whether they had ADHD or uh, autism spectrum disorders, whatever. And he would teach them in a personalized way, in a way that Salmi is talking about. It's individualized, you know, like Jason mentioned, his company's got an individualized goals and learning program. Well, unfortunately, the, um, this lab got closed down about a year ago, I think, roughly. And it was, it was like a dagger to my son's heart because as a child with learning challenges, that was one of the reasons why he loved going to school. Otherwise, he'd get up every morning and say to me, Dada, I hate going to school. I mean, it's one of the best schools in the world he could go to, right? What do you say to your son who's going to one of the best schools in the world? And that thing that the only thing that he wanted is gone. I think it'd be personally, and I'm pushing a, my own political barrow here. I'll be transparent about it. But things like that, that, and that which is an investment from the school, because obviously you want to scale and you want to have efficiency. But if we really want to do uh, justice to neurodiverse people, we do need to spend, we need to invest in this mentorship, uh, whether it's to address that person who asked the question, how do we help them transition or cope with dead end jobs? Or whether it's just getting the best out of people in alignment, we need to we need to make sure we have these extra bits that we tack on and make them available. Not to everyone. Not everyone will want to go to uh, the lab and do STEM extra STEM stuff because that's what they're geeking out on. They'd rather just do their curriculum and go home in the afternoon. But for those kids who are neurodiverse and don't function so well socially in the bigger groups because they're shy or embarrassed or are afraid of their giftedness because they don't want to be special, they just want to be a normal regular kid then, uh, you know, we, do, we need to visit that and invest in it, just like the mentorship program uh, Selma mentioned, like the individualized uh, growth plans. Sounds like a growth plan that Nick, uh, sorry, that Jason mentioned. We need to do that in schools too. Uh, we need to, we're trailing industry here. You know, we need to get ahead again. We need to at least be on the same path. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's what we need to do, invest in it. Thank you everybody we're out of time but you know what's what's emerging from me here is such a sense of synergy of aspiration as you as you've said scott you know maybe we're not where we want to be yet but it's conversations like this that allow us to hear as educators what's happening in the world and, and reflect and think about how we need to adjust and shape to it and the clear thing emerging is that people come first that you look after people not just because it's the right thing to do because it will prepare them for a successful life it'll help transform the economy maybe get rid of a legacy economy maybe move to new futures so you know, if we're looking at the future of work, as we've been doing, and we're talking about learning to shape the future, the synergy there is obvious. Uh, it's a conversation that's not going to stop here. But I'm enormously grateful to you for your time today. I'm sure um, people will know your names and you'll be bombarded with questions from uh, <laughs> from lots of people now. Thank you so much. Desperately grateful to, to everybody for, for, for these conversations, and we look forward to continuing them further. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Hopefully uh, we'll see you at some other sessions later this afternoon, uh, but a huge thanks to our panelists, especially. Thanks, thanks Nick. everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.